Well, good evening, everyone. I, I know some of you are still getting seated, but I'm going to uh, get us going here because as one is wont to do as a professor, I have many things to say before we get underway. So welcome to the Lougheed College Lectures. My name is Lois Harder, and I have the distinct privilege to be the principal of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College and to welcome you here this evening. As we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of Métis and First Nations people. In my view, reconciliation should be a central concern for 21st century leaders, and so a territorial acknowledgement is one small gesture in that important project. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Sing Crude Canada, for supporting these lectures, and by extension, leadership development here at the university. The Peter Lougheed Leadership College was established in 2015 with the help of several generous donors and the support of the Lougheed family. Peter Lougheed was himself a talented young leader in his university days and of course afterwards. He was a member of the Golden Bears football team, president of Delta Upsilon fraternity and the president of the Students' Union. He would go on to study law and gain an MBA from Harvard, play football for the Edmonton Eskimos, and of course, have a very storied career as Alberta's first progressive conservative premier, a post he held from 1971 to 1985. Regardless of one's political alignment, we should all be able to agree that Peter Lougheed's dedication to a publicly spirited leadership was unassailable and that dedication certainly inspires the Lougheed Leadership College. So the college is an interdisciplinary center for leadership education. We aim to equip people with knowledge and skills that will enable them to engage with diverse people and ideas and build their leadership capacity. Our programming includes courses and a certificate program for undergraduate students, and we are currently recruiting for our next intake of students, so if you are a person who is interested in doing that, or you know a young person who might be, bring them along. Um, and we also teach leadership development for graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, and work on leadership development collaboratively with uh, our university partners, with various community business um, and other organizations, and of course, as we see tonight, government partners. We have a dynamic mentorship program, and all of our undergraduate students engage in community service through something we call a stretch experience. And we also host this inspiring Lougheed College lecture series, this year organized around the theme of what's next for Alberta. I have a couple of bits of business before we get to the matter at hand. First of all, we want to thank everyone who donated to the Campus Food Bank this evening. If you did not happen to have a can of something in your bag, uh, we invite you to donate online. And during the panel discussion tonight, we ask uh, that you do not take any audio or video recordings, and as the lecture will be recorded and will be available uh, to stream on our website. Finally, our next lecture will be on Thursday, January 16th from 6.30 to 8 in the TELUS Center, and the topic is Truth and Reconciliation, featuring the Makokas family, including Janice Makokas, James Makokas, and Anthony Johnson. Those last two names you might recognize as the team that recently won the Amazing Race Canada. Now, for the reason you are all here, this auspicious panel on digital leadership the inspiration for this panel came, as I was saying earlier, from my colleague, Dr. Gordon Gao, who is a professor in the Faculty of Extension and the academic director for the graduate program in communication and technology. Last spring, Gordon called me up and asked me, as the principal of a leadership college, what I knew about digital leadership, which, um, of course, in my job as a leader is also to demonstrate humility, which was very easy to do in the face of that question because I had no answer. Um, but uh, fortunately, I, I do know people who know people, and so I got in touch with Dominique and 
my colleagues at the university as well, and eventually this fantastic crew of people, including James McKee, who's up there, and Blair Neufeld, et cetera, Blair Neufeld, who's someone I went to grade one with, you know, all, all these people emerged um, to make this evening possible. Um, so our esteemed panelists this evening include Alex Benet, Dominique Bone, and Roger Oldham. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about each of these folks. Alex Benet recently joined KPMG Canada as a partner in the Digital and Government Solutions Group and is working with the company's public sector clients to implement technology solutions like artificial intelligence, blockchain, data security and privacy, digital ID and cloud computing. Alex is a graduate from the University of Ottawa and he has held leadership roles across government and corporate sectors. Some of those positions include Chief Client Officer at Mindbridge AI, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Canada Science and Technology Museums Corporation, Deputy Minister at the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat, and the Chief Information Officer of Canada. He was recently named to Apolitical's international list of the 100 most influ influential people in digital government. Next, we have Dominique Bone, who is the Chief Digital Officer at the relatively new Digital Innovation Office at the Government of Alberta. Um, and now I have lost my slip of paper that, oh, here we are, okay, sorry. Previously, Dominique uh, led a number of transformative initiatives with the Government of, of British Columbia, notably with the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Environment to modernize and integrate court services and promote public transparency initiatives in natural resource management and decision making. And Roger Oldham. Roger was the founding digi chief digital officer at the United Kingdom's Ministry of Justice, where he created Justice Digital, the first digital startup in a UK government delivery department. He found his way to the UK Ministry of Justice via the Financial Times of London and Europe's biggest business media company, Read Business Information. These days, he is based in Vancouver, where he works with government and large pre-internet clients. Do those really still exist? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, to redesign their institutions, services, and products for the internet era. So I'm going to cede the floor here to Dominique, who has some things to say by way of introduction to her role and, uh, and to guide this discussion. And so there will be some backing and forthing, a little interaction, and then we are really looking forward to discussion with the audience as well. <laughs> okay, I have been told the microphone is at lowest height and that I will need to adjust it, obviously. Okay, is that okay? Thank you so much for the kind words, Lois, and again for having us here. This is a wonderful opportunity. We're so appreciative. And thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for coming out today to think about leadership in government. I am super hopeful that some of you are in digital leadership roles, whether officially or unofficially, or thinking about taking that kind of role on. And if that's you, I suspect it's because you see problems that need to be fixed in government. Um, that's my life's work, um, particularly the unglamorous work of making government services work better for the people who use them, and just as much for the folks who deliver them. Um, I'm going to share the stage soon um, with my two much more glamorous colleagues, both of whom have been in very high profile and very hard digital leadership roles. Um, you're going to be just amazed at their insights, and I know them both to be, um, although glamorous, um, really very generous in their, in their sharing of their insights, so it's, it's going to be great. But um, I can't cede this podium these days without talking a bit about the work that we have underway in the provincial government with the Digital Innovation Office. So we were started about a year and a half ago. We work in Executive Council of Government. Um, very small group, we're six people. I think they're all here in their small footprint and, and a few other friends helping. Um, but we, we have a huge mandate and really it is, you know, make services better, all of them, and save money, lots of it, and mostly using the internet. You know, that's about it. So it's big and it's really super, super exciting. Um, and really for me, you know, now more than ever, um, 
No secret that with the recent provincial budget, um, which is certainly just as much affecting core government as it is post-secondaries and municipalities, we need to adjust to significant year-over-year -year reductions. And these are not going to be sort of one-time, you know, crunches. This is going to be sustained, um, sustained lowering of budgets that we need to deal with. Um, and there's huge anxiety right now in the public sector. Um, you know, people are concerned, of course, about their own jobs and their teams and their jobs. Um, but what I'm really finding, and you know, amongst my colleagues in government, is that the real concern is for the people that we serve. It's for the clients who we serve in government. Um, right now, our group are doing quite a bit of work in the social sector, and you know, we are dealing with organizations that, at best, their budgets are going to be flat, if not going down, and their caseload, in some cases, is almost double. So, you know, as the economy slows in Alberta, there are more and more people who are vulnerable and who need more help from government, and yet, you know, we have less to do with it. So it's, we are really looking at how can we, how can we provide those services, these things that only government can provide, and how can we do that in this context? Um, some of you may have seen the McKinnon report, which really set the stage for this current budget. Um, I don't want to be all gloom and doom. It's, it's going to get positive, um, for sure. And, you know, in that report, there's, there's a lot of big things that my little office can't take on. I mean, there's things like, you know, compensation for physicians and big, big things. And my colleagues in government are really looking at really managing how can we, how can we make these changes? How can we do these things in humane ways? How can we, how can we make these cuts? You know, in fact, maybe an opportunity. But, but for our office, we found some some, actually some encouragement in their report. So to quote, with overarching challenges such as those identified in the panel's report, there is urgency to retool the public service to be focused on innovation and a citizen-centric approach to service delivery and a commitment to linking funds allocated to measurable results. Um, I think that's a great call to action. I think that's something we can really work with. Um, so, you know, under the heading of never let a good crisis go to waste, um, other governments have faced really similar, uh, similar things, you know, um, Roger's probably going to talk about that. You were in such a government in the UK. Um, and, you know, the kind of innovation work that can be done, it can really, you know, it can help mitigate some of this crisis and really be a catalyst to make government work better. But it's going to require substantive, structural, and really hard change. And that's not something that governments are historically comfortable with. Um, but our office is in that business. It is our jam, making big, hard changes. So, briefly, I just want to talk to you a little bit about how we do it. First, we're pretty clear about what innovation is, right? It, the working definition for me, it's measurable tangible and dramatic solutions to a known problem experienced by real people. So, you know, like the Google, Google as a search engine was, a, was an innovation. I mean, at the time, the internet was growing and it was unindexed and no one could find anything. That was a good innovation. Like Google Glass, Google Hangouts, not so much. Like those were, you know, shiny things looking for a problem. So we really focus on real problems and try to tackle them. So some practices that we, that we use. Uh, we start by starting. So we set up small cross-functional teams, and these include people like user experience designers, developers who are comfortable working with newer tools, policy folks, frontline delivery folks, and we deliver working software based on stakeholder and user research in about eight weeks. We try to get to some kind of a, what we call a minimum viable product, and I'll get a little bit nerdy about the digital stuff, so just bear with me. Um, rather than you know, years of writing business requirements and you know, that are often obsolete before you actually build any software, or you know, really long-winded business cases that you know, ask for big amounts of money in government to do big things, we ask for smaller amounts so we can get started and we can actually really put services into people's hands sooner. Um, we are in it always for Albertans. So we do early and ongoing discovery work with people in their natural habitats and we only build what people really need, you know. Um, we, we, we're concerned about better days at work for staff. So we have empowered delivery teams, better tools, meaningful jobs, um, also real opportunities for innovative companies to work with government. Um, I think too often, you know, we as government have handed over our technology and our service delivery to large multinational companies in the interest of managing risk, because maybe we feel more comfortable with, with big IT companies, but it really hasn't always gone well. Um, Alex might talk about some of that. Um, it's been too costly, and it's given us a kind of learned helplessness around IT, and I think our group is really there to try to, to, try to change that. We work in the open. We use a kind of soft version of agile 
agile development, agile software development, some of you might be familiar with that. We work in short sprints, and we, uh, we, we show the work that we're doing to everyone who has an interest in seeing it, everyone who wants to show up. Um, we publish code, we publish design patterns, we try to reuse what we build. Um, so we believe in really, you know, living, living technology, really. And we save money here. And, you know, that saving money, again, it really matters. Again, let's think about those trajectories. Flat budgets, more people need government services. We want to make sure that more of government money is going into the hands of the people who need it, and less of it is, you know, is, is in, the, in the, the mechanics of the delivery. Um, so yeah, we deliver incrementally and bravely. Um, you know, frankly, I think government does overspend and overplan and normalize delay. Um, we try to flip that script and really think about value, even if it's small, so that you know whatever kind of thing that we can release to users, we do and try to find that value. We expect we expect the world to work like that. We expect everything on our phones to update, you know, instantly. But government seems to just stall endlessly and serve up kind of mediocre product. So we think we can do better. We're proving that we can do better. And it's not because we lack good people or goodwill in government. It's really often because we fear the wrong things. We have a really funny sense of what, what counts as risk. So antiquated processes, we're working on those too. Um, for our group, it's really about finding the others. We're really trying to be a hub for digital practitioners and those who are aspiring to that, inside government and outside. Do a lot of events, do a lot of training. It's a great opportunity to do things like this. Um, yeah, and that's, that's what we're here for. So, you know, all this together, it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work, it's a lot of fun work. We believe that it takes both evidence and empathy to make government better, and we believe that it can be done. The government truly can be better. So, with that, I am going to take a seat, I think, and uh, do a little bit of a, a little bit of a, it, it, as I say, both of these gentlemen who you've been introduced to have had really, really challenging jobs. I mean, Alex being the Chief Information Officer for the Government of Canada. I mean, can I just say this, like, after Phoenix, right? Like, man, you know, well, that's just it. I mean, he just was brought clear. in after that happened. Like, you know, so I think that that was probably one of the hardest jobs ever in, in digital leadership. And frankly, I don't think your gig was any easier, Roger, because I mean, the UK was, was looking at just dramatic budget cuts and had to completely try to rethink how everything was done in technology. And justice, I think, was probably one of the hardest sectors to work in in government. I mean, frankly, the most tradition-bound and paper-bound, and you were the chief digital officer. So I think it's a really interesting opportunity, um, folks who've really had some of the hardest jobs in doing this. And I think there's, you know, we can, we can learn from this. I think we're gonna do, do a couple of opening comments from Roger and then a couple from Alex and we'll, I won't call it a cage match even though I want to, but we'll see how it goes. I got some questions for them. Um, we'll, do, yeah, we'll do opening remarks. I've got a few questions I want to ask both of these guys and then we're hoping to have plenty of time that we can hear your questions for them as well. Thanks. Thanks, Dominique. Um, I'm just gonna put uh, this here so I can see how long I witter on for. Um, one of my favorite quotes about digital government um, comes from Michael Slaby, who was the CTO for um, Obama for America, and he said, he said this, he said, it's not complicated, it's just hard. Um, and actually, the principles that we can apply to any kind of pre-internet era organization of which government is one, so an organization which existed before the internet and um, has had to find ways or needs to find ways to adapt to becoming of the internet um, are actually fairly straightforward. It's about how we go about doing that. And I think that digital leadership really, certainly in my experience, is, um, is a, you know, simply in 2019 is just a question of leadership, right? So for all of us, um, leaders in any context, no matter what it is that we're doing, whatever the kind of organization is that we're working in, um, we need to, if you like, have something of uh, an awareness about what it means to be um, truly an internet era organization. Um, and we need to be able to apply those. We need to be able to lead our people forward um, into um, a future which is adapted to the internet. Um, and so my favorite quote, um, my favorite definition, if you like, about digital comes from Tom Luce Moore, who was one of the founders of the Government Digital Service in the UK. And he says this, he says, digital is applying the culture, the processes, the business models, and the technologies of the internet era to people's raised expectations. And really, when I dove into government back in 2010, 
2011, um, that's what it was all about. That's what it was, the challenge was, was exactly that. It was to really kind of drag um, an organization that was very much um, mired in the processes and practices of the past. You know, lots of paper. I mean, the justice system really hadn't changed that much since about the 12th century when, you know, horses would gallop up and down the country with sheaves of paper. Um, and actually, they were just moved around in slightly more modern ways, but um, very, very um, entrenched ways of working. And so um, the big challenge really was about, well, how do we kind of take that um, organization and how do we kind of make it, you know, to be uh, an organization that's fit for purpose in the internet era? Um, and so we kind of had this situation which we kind of affectionately called the square of despair, I think a term that was coined by Liam Maxwell, um, who was the government CTO at the time, um, which really said that, you know, actually we face these four forces. We haven't got enough money, as Dominique was saying, very much like um, you're facing in Alberta today. So we had the crisis of austerity. Um, you know, users were an afterthought. We didn't consult them early enough in the process. Often, invariably, we didn't consult them at all. Um, procurement was a nightmare. You know, we had procurement paralysis. We couldn't buy the things that we needed to, do, to, to buy, both in terms of the products. We couldn't access the people we needed to access. Um, and then also, we had all this legacy stuff, right? All this kind of wiring, this kind of technology spaghetti. Um, and, you know, every time, you know, you sat in a meeting, you try to do anything, um, you know, up pops someone from the Department of No, as Liam liked to say, and, um, and you know, you were back to square one. So, so this kind of delivery crisis, and so the strategy in the UK became um, very much focused on delivery, moving away from like this kind of, you know, paralysis which had set in to focusing on how do we deliver great services and how do we get things out the door faster? Um, and, and so, you know, the question is, where, you, where do you start? You know, you can't boil the ocean. You have to start somewhere. And so we picked a bunch of exemplar services. Um, and I would sort of caution here. I'd say not pilots, um, but exemplars. So services that we actually wanted to transform, that we wanted to change, that we wanted to redesign to meet user needs. Um, and we used those as vehicles for change, right? So we used those not only to deliver improved services, to users, so there's actually concrete value in each of those specific um, service scenarios um, being delivered to the users, but also so we could tackle some of the associated issues around governance, procurement, you know, security, legacy, all these things. Um, and, and so really, I, I think, you know, my sort of hypothesis, if you like, is that um, digital leadership is all about um, building um, an agile, service delivery organization um, that can respond to those raised expectations in the internet era. And I think there's four things that I would particularly point out that I'm sure we'll talk more about. But the first of those is that digital leaders have to be relentlessly focused on meeting user need. You know, if you look at like Amazon um, and Jeff Bezos, um, you know, he says that they're obsessed by the customer. They start with customer need and they work backwards. It's no different in, in government. It's no different in any uh, effective internet era organization. Um, it doesn't matter where you work. You need to have a deep understanding of your news and need. How do you do that? Um, well, it's not just about sending out some surveys, right? It's about actually you know, getting out there, um, observing real users, you know, interacting with them, involving them throughout the service design and delivery process. Um, the second thing is that I think great digital leadership requires um, uh, an emphasis on insourcing capability and insourcing um, and building product teams, you know, so funding teams rather than projects. And this is a bit of a, uh, you know, there's, I guess you would say there's a pendulum swing back and forth between insourcing and outsourcing um, in different organizations over the years. But actually, um, this is something that, that I see pretty much everywhere. Um, anyone who's doing anything um, really successfully to transform public service is um, also able to access a pool of makers, people who can actually act on the things that you need to do and build and design the kind of services that you need to design for users. Um, and those, those teams then can change by doing, right? So this is how we start to demonstrate um, the power of what we're doing um, and, and make, the, make the case, if you like, for this kind of way of working. So for me, when I was setting things up in Justice, it wasn't like they said, well, great, Roger, you know, delighted to have you. Um, here's this massive pile of money. Here's this unlimited headcount. Um, 
No, I mean, like, like many uh, of you, I, will, I started in a, in, a, in a context where the case for working in dif a different way had to be made, um, where you know, kind of, um, money was scarce, uh, where we had to demonstrate very, very quickly the power of um, delivery and working in different ways. And so it's really important to get that team in place and to get them iterating um, and starting to ship, if you like, services quickly and deliver you know, concrete value. Um, and then really the, the, the final thing is to say that, um, you know, I think that it requires all of us who work in these contexts where there's lots of legacy challenges to overcome to be bold. Um, and I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the UK civil service about making boldness an explicit value. Um, I think it's something that is very important. I think great digital leadership requires you to um, be disruptive, um, to, to be trusted as well, to earn trust. But actually, I think in general, for those of us um, who, um, you know, I'm guessing most of, most of you in the room are Canadian, um, uh, rather, rather like the Brits, we can tend to be quite polite um, and we don't want to ruffle feathers. And so actually being disruptive is often the thing which is harder. Um, we find it easier to... Um, you know, to work in the currency of the interactions that we have and to build trust than we often do to be disruptive and bold. Um, but that's a very important thing, I think, um, to consider um, as you go on your leadership journey. So there's many more things I could say, but I feel I should uh, uh, hand across to, to Alex to uh, tell us a little bit about his background. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so, Dominic, yeah, thank you. So Dominic wanted a cage match, and so far I have to say I, I, want, I agree with both of you, so the only thing I'll do different is I'll stay seated if that's okay. Uh, very, you know, Canadian sort of, you know, crises. Um, so first of all, if I could just throw a hand, who's from the government of Alberta? Okay, who's from the city of Edmonton? I'm rocking your socks, by the way, today, so thank you. Uh, and if you're from the university? Okay, and there's probably like a few of you that didn't put your hand up, so you're probably lost and in the wrong place tonight, so... You're here for the, for the entertainment. So first of all, let me thank you. If you work in the public service, I always start off with that. I know how hard it is. Uh, we all carry different levels of scars. It is the hardest place um, to, emotional scars, mostly. Um, few lashings. But uh, it, is the, it, is, it is the, like I've been fortunate to come in and out of the public and private sector, crown corporations, and it is the hardest place to enact change, but it's also the most rewarding. So it's a double-edged sword. So thank you for your work. I should have changed my phone features because my phone keeps locking every 10 <laughs> seconds. Um, so I do apologize if I look like I'm out of, of, of whack here. Um, the federal government is an absolute beast of a monster. Um, in the tech, data, digital space, it's 25,000 people, it's $7 billion a year. Um, and I don't say that as a badge of honor. Um, so it is a very, very difficult place to operate. And I will say it, um, and, and, and I say this context so that you know where the next few minutes of my comments come from. Uh, it is also one of the most rewarding places I've ever worked in my life. Okay, so because we were going to talk about leadership, I won't get into sort of the particulars of anything. I, I, I will focus for me personally because I was, you know, you're sitting on 25,000 people and $7 billion and exploding things that just keep exploding uh, or that you inherit from previous people. Uh, if any of you have either directly been in, I feel like I have to say this every time, every time. If either of you or your spouses or your friends have been impacted by the federal government Phoenix pay situation, I always feel like I have to apologize on behalf of the government of Canada. Um, because it is probably the biggest failure, a leadership failure in the history of the public service, I would think. Um, this thing is affecting people's pensions. Uh, people are taking their lives from it. Uh, and it all happened because leadership in the civil service wasn't ready for the pace and the impact of the digital world that we live in, and we have not adjusted our leadership behaviors from the industrial age, where things were frankly just slower, where you didn't have Twitter, where you didn't have any of these public relations things happening at a nanosecond. So all of our actual leadership structures aren't ready. We haven't trained our public service leaders, and especially in places where, you know, and I'm not, this isn't a knock on Edmonton, you guys have amazing hosts, very similar to Ottawa, but Edmonton's a government town a lot, in a lot of cases, and so is Ottawa. So sometimes you get a fourth or fifth generation public servant, and there's nothing wrong with that. 
But the difference with London would be you have three or four other sectors, the skills are changing. And so the mindset is very hard to change when it's in a bubble. So four things, uh, leadership, I fully agree. Digital leadership is no different than leadership. It's just it has to change in the context that we live in. Uh, you need courage. So every time I've changed sector, the biggest mistake I've made is I've listened to people tell me how I needed to be lobotomized because in the private sector, this is how we do things. You government people, you don't know what you're doing. And then when I returned to government, government people were like, well, this is how you do procurement and this is how you manage things in the public sector. It's very different, very different than the private sector. Um, so the courage to actually you know, follow your gut on stuff in the context of the world that we live in is extremely important. Um, you usually will end up in a job and you're there for a reason. People selected you for a reason, so follow that gut. Courage to stand in the way of things like passive aggressiveness. There's no passive aggressiveness in the public service at any levels. Right? Understanding how to navigate that right? and to stand up for it. It's too easy to fit in a government box um, and, and really you should be going into your job from day one ready to get fired. If you really want to enact change, if you're there for a pension, you won't change. If you're not going into a job ready to get fired, you, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna do anything. You're actually gonna accomplish nothing. So, um, you know, I mean, I didn't get fired for the record. I chose to leave government, just so we're clear. <laughs> Just 100% clear. Second thing, um, I think the role of supporting talent in a digital context is one of the things that's very different from, let's say, leadership from 20 years ago. Uh, a lot of the best projects I've ever seen come out of the federal government have come out from like people that were called crazy. Uh, you know, so someone that said, I wanted to take staffing from 200 days down to 30 days, and I could do it if you just give me a couple hundred thousand, because it's not a question of money, it's a question of doing things differently. So, so as a leader, one of the things you have to do is you actually have to get to a point where you're supporting talent very, very differently. You have to know your organization. You have to, you know, even as a deputy minister, know who your programmers are, right? And, and know who the crazy ones are and actually find a way to support them. Pardon the language, be the shit umbrella that they need in order to get things out of the way, remove roadblocks, and you have to get involved in the day-to-day. -day. You can't just sit on a deputy minister perch and actually just manage up if you want to enact change. So the second thing is, the third thing would be to, to actually get dirty, right? And it's kind of related to my second point. You can't just go through briefing notes. So it's great that you've identified talent. It's great that you're, you know, a poo-poo umbrella, but if you're not gonna talk to them day in and day out and give them space and actually get your hands dirty in delivery, you're actually not leading, right? You're, you're just a briefing mechanism, like, and, and you're managing politics which is in itself hard, but, but nevertheless, if you want to enact digital change. The last part I'd leave you with is you absolutely must be truthful. Um, things happen very quickly. It's not easy to be truthful all the time uh, in a context where, for example, you know, Phoenix was reported green until launch in the government of Canada. By the way, if you don't know Phoenix, just Google Phoenix, Ottawa, and grab a 2-4, because uh, it'll take you that long. Uh, to go through literally everything. Um, but we were reporting green on that thing until it launched. We were reporting green on that thing when people weren't getting paid. We had people that were being told by their staff that their mortgage was going to get in trouble because they weren't getting paid and we were telling them it wasn't that bad, okay? Until about six months in. So you have to be truthful to yourself. Um, you also have to be truthful with elected officials. You know, it's not easy managing elected officials. In the private sector, you'd manage shareholders or other things. Managing elected officials is really, really hard, right? Because digital isn't about the app. It's not about the shiny thing. It's actually about changing laws. That, that takes a long time, at least in the federal government. Um, and that's not always something that's a sexy announceable, right? So, so being truthful with a minister that, you know, this app is a great idea, minister, but what I really need you to do is change our privacy laws because our country is being totally dominated by large platforms and how they commercialize data without any kind of intent to bend uh, is not a sexy conversation. In fact, it can be really hard because those same companies want to invest in the country and that's a good announcement, okay? So, so being truthful to ministers is also not something that's very easy in the context or, or you know, mayors or other things in the context of public digital leadership. So the last part that I'd say is, is, is humility. Um, and I think it came across uh, with both of your messages. But if you're going to walk in, like, so, so yeah, I kind of chuckled when you said, uh, sorry, when you introduced, here are the things Alex is going to do at KPMG. Like, I know half of those. 
Um, like as if the CIO of Canada, I knew someone would come in and talk to me about blockchain and I'd be like, You're, why are you talking to me like you think I know this thing? Like this is like the most nebulous thing I've ever heard. And none of you can explain it either, by the way. <laughs> so don't lie, be truthful. So on that note, uh, happy to take any questions, talk about failures. That's probably the last thing I'll leave you with is you have to get used to the four letter word that starts with F and you have to get really comfortable with it and you have to promote it. So uh, happy to talk about anything that went wrong in the federal government because God, you know, nothing goes wrong. Those are great words. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> that is fabulous. I actually would like to talk about some of those like blockchain things. You know? <laughs> sure. Um, well, well, no, because here, 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 oh, artificial intelligence, discuss. You know, I mean, we're sitting here at this university where there's there's amazing um, work being done on AI. Um, I feel like I'm sometimes asked, you know, well, you're the digital innovation office. Like, <laughs> do AI? Won't that fix everything? You don't need to go talk to users and that stuff you were talking about, Roger. Just, just you know, apply some technology to the problem. Won't that work? Gentlemen? Um, <laughs> I'll be polite, you go Isn't first. Isn't that what oh, it yeah. is? Okay. Um, well, listen, um, there's always a new hype technology, and that's not to say that things like AI, blockchain, um, are not going to be important, um, of course. But I think when you're in a, a context where you are you know, um, almost kind of paralyzed uh, in delivering service experiences which are, you know, often Victorian, right? Um, that is not the starting place. So I think that, um, you know, um, the, other, the other point around, you know, technology is that for a digital leader, sure, you need to be aware of these things, but you don't be too distracted by them. So I would say, like, you know, my context in the Ministry of Justice um, probably like less than 1% of the problems that we had were going to be solved by you know, AI. Um, because actually, there's, the job really at the moment is about fixing the plumbing. Now, that's not to say that um, there won't be some application of AI it, that may be interesting um, in different areas, but um, that's not the starting point. So I think it's you know, starting with the user needs, you know, then asking, you know, what's the policy need? What's the system need? Finally, what's the best technology that we use to deliver on that. So that's the way I would look at it, at least. Um, yeah, so I absolutely agree. Start with the problem. Um, I do think of all the technologies that, that are hyped, I, I, like personally, I do think AI is one of those that will actually impact, maybe not today, but down the road, sort of societal structures a little bit. Um, anything that touches financial data is better, a machine is better than a human. Yeah. Um, you know, hands down, anything that's process driven, a machine is better than a human. The question is, is we can't always apply it really well today within a context or within a project or within a service. So that's the first thing. But with AI, some of the stuff that worries me the most and some of the stuff that got me in trouble, frankly, um, in my previous job was we had a really hard time working with suppliers that were providing a black box algorithm mm. to provide a service to citizens. Um, because we were inadvertently giving the power of the decision from humans and elected officials to machines because intellectual property discussions came into play or national investments by companies in the country became part of the discussion and pressure. Um, but if you are giving a triage decision at a hospital to a machine uh, for which you have no access to the algorithm, even worse, you probably have no one in your organization that could actually read the algorithm anyways, um, then you're actually handing over you know, life and death decisions to a machine without any kind of ethical framework around it. So, so I'm, I, I hope that any organization that's, that's moving towards you know, AI studies and things like that, like, like that's where sort of the cross-pollination of sectors yeah. becomes super interesting around ethics, you know, around philosophy to that extent, and, and around sort of human-centric design stuff, because there's a lot of cases where um, some companies have given products for free around AI in the healthcare space and, and, and in other spaces, and it's, it's well intended, okay? You have to understand these companies aren't out to screw citizens or governments, but it's just like the models that we have for government, for governance, they're just not quite there yet. And so here we are accepting black box algorithms or outputs mm -hmm. and not always being able to explain them. Um, so, so that for me became on a policy level because yeah. a lot of my work was policy was like, trying to A, get educated on that. And the best way to counter that was just to start developing our policies in the open 
Yeah. So we were going draconian, where if we're going to use algorithms, we had to publish the algorithm. Hmm. It turns out, like, companies don't like that, you know. <laughs> So, so it turns out, again, then they have a lobby arm, and those lobby mm. arms go to elected officials, and then you go to, you know, you know the principal's office, basically, mm. explaining it. But the good news is if you do develop the policy in the open, then it became a dialogue, at least, right? right? And that was the, the best way we had to kind of counter the AI thing. So I think lots mm. of hype, okay. not a lot of application, absolutely, but there's some fundamental issues there, that, like whether it's laws or other things that we have to look at, we that, that we're just not ready for this. Yep. Absolutely. Well, and again, it's an opportunity we have here, I think, because we do have some great leadership in the province at this university, and we need to do more together. And Skynet is coming, for sure, so we should definitely... There you go. Okay. <laughs> so I, I was talking a little bit about where we're at in a budget situation, and certainly part of leadership. I mean, it's kind of funny, because when I sit around tables with government leaders, you know, there's an expectation that as, a, you know, as an assistant deputy minister and deputy minister, you have to understand how to do finance, and you have to understand how to do HR, and you have to understand how to do policy, but no one ever says you have to understand how to do digital. Like, it's like people just push themselves away from the table when that comes up. But anyway, I mean, the budgeting question's a big one, right? Like, how, in a situation, as a leader, um, how do we handle, as a digital leader, let's say, how do we handle these kind of budget cuts? Like, how do we think about where we spend, where we invest, and where we can afford to cut? How do we make those kind of hard decisions now? Would you say, either one of you? What, are the, what should the priorities be now? My last answer was too long, so you go. <laughs> yeah, that was rich. Well, listen, I mean, there's any one of a number of different ways that you can actually identify where to start. So um, clearly one of, the, one of the things to consider is, and this is the way we can tackle things in the UK, we looked at um, volume of transactions that were passing through our services, and we said, okay, you know, out of the seven, 800 services that we operate right across government, um, we have this um, you know, level of transactions that um, is such that about, around about 95% of um, the volume is with 50 of those hmm. seven to 800 services. When you start to kind of delve into how those services are operating, and this is typical for almost any public service, I'd say, you start to identify levels of failure demand, which come from um, the fact that you've got a demand being placed on government or um, the public service or the organization in one area because of a failure in the way that the service is delivered today. And that can be purely as a result of the way that the services just failed to catch up with the internet era, mm -hmm. or it can actually be because we've done something terrible, like we've digitized an existing broken process, <laughs> um, and therefore we've made it really difficult for people to access the service. And actually that is also, as well as the, the stress and the cost to the user in terms of their time, there's also a cost to government in terms of the operation of things like contact centers, typically. Um, you know, we identified in, in the UK that, um, back when I started out, that something like 700 um, million calls were coming through our contact centers. Um, around about 150 million of those were self-reported as avoidable, at a cost of six pounds, 28 pence per call. So that's about, you, know, you do the math, that's a, that's a lot of, that's a significant amount of, uh, of money, so 150 million, six, six pound 28, it's about a billion pounds of cost. Um, and so when you start to identify some of those big numbers, which by the way, um, comes from getting under the skin of the user need and understanding how users are actually interacting with services today, um, you start to then be able to make the case, even in an environment of austerity for um, you know, working in a different way to release some of those savings. So. I, I would say typically that's the, that's the way I would approach it. Well, and, and being honest, I think, right? I mean, actually looking at the real total cost of that service, right? Actually, because you can run those kind of call centers and say, out of those millions of calls, 99 out of 100 were answered within 22 seconds, yeah. and people thought they were great. Right. You know, so that service is doing fine. Yeah. It's like, oh, but we don't need it if mm. we actually you know, yeah. can avoid it in other ways. So, mm -hmm. anything to add, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm, it may not be yeah. a popular answer. Yeah, you do. Yeah, it, this may not be a popular answer. I, I, I think the whole concept of doing digital and needing resources is a bit of a myth. I think if we do, to your point, if we digitize an industrial age thing, mm -hmm. that's expensive. If yeah. we maintain legacy because we're lacking courage to do the thing different, that's expensive. Um, 
But you know, if you're really going to do co-design or digital things, then just put the data out there. You know, change your your public sector fake procurement process, which is not <laughs> transparent. Just so we're clear, okay. Um, Usually we go to tender because we want a piece of something to fit into an existing architecture and there's a whole team of proposal managers in the companies that looks at the bids and says this is for Oracle, that's for IBM, oh this one's for our company, right? That's not, that's not transparent, but if you're actually able to release all the data, put a challenge out there, don't put the desired outcome and actually co-design with people, like that's a lot less expensive. Um, and so if I compare, let's say, let's, let's keep picking on Phoenix. Phoenix um, you know, it was supposed to be a $300 million project to, you know, replace HR and pay turned into, I think, by the time it's done, it'll be about $6 billion. Um, uh, so that's another half a, half a billion a year. Yeah, but we kept doing it, right? We, 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 we you know, we're not running towards a cliff. We're not, we're not we fell. <laughs> um, but the replacement project, because there, you know, it took us two years to react to, to do the thing different. The replacement project, we didn't do requirements. Within five months, we just put the problem on the street. I think the problem was documented enough, right? Like everybody and, and their uncle had a crack at this thing. We just put the problem out and within five months, we, and we, we cut out system integrators. Um, we dealt with you know, a commodity, which is pay, which most people get paid. And we just put the problem out and we made the entire procurement process transparent. We put all the anonymized data back into the hands of, the, of the, these commodity companies that do HR and pay. Within five months, we had three companies that fit what we could do and that we could actually start moving towards a replacement. We did that with $8 million, less than $8 million, less than six months, about 25 people. Because we were doing the thing different as opposed to just, well, let's define our new requirements or our business process or whatever else that has happened. So in a lot of cases, it's just not doing something and stopping it and moving it over to something else. Yeah. Uh, and doing the thing completely different. So, so like seven billion dollars in the government of Canada should be enough to take care of most of our most of our needs. Uh, it's not a question of new money. It just becomes expensive if you don't cut the ball and chain. Whether that's design thinking, whether that's des poor management, or a whole bunch of other things. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to make sure we get some questions from the audience, but I just have one more, just kind of round it off with you guys. So, what do you think are the you know the the really key capabilities or skills that we need in digital leaders? What are the things we should be you know, cultivating people towards, that we should be looking for when we hire, that we should be you know, learning ourselves? You want me, I, I've been like giving you no time to think, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go, so it's only fair. Uh, and it's gonna be a horrible answer as a result. Um, <laughs> um, I think our, the leaders that I've interacted with in the public service, whether I've been in a private sector or in the public service, that are the most successful in this digital things <laughs> are the ones that are comfortable with the, the word fail. And that understand that, you know, we, 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 we continue to fail if we don't accept failure. Like it just creates a tinderbox environment for things to not work even more. So uh, a quick example, when I was with OpenText, which by the way, one of Canada's largest software companies, because Canada doesn't sort of, you know, have a, you know, the corporations in Canada, anyways, it is what it is. We're, we're nice people, but we don't always, you know, understand that our corporations form our identity either. So OpenText, largest software in Canada, company in Canada, um, for the G20, we had a, you know, we did a lot of work when the G20 came to Toronto. And the only reason it happened, and I had left public service disenfranchised at that point. I was like, you know, Nine years in, you just wait, wait your time, get promoted, get your pension. That's not for me. Uh, nobody knows what they're doing. But anyways, not happy. And uh, so we started doing work with this assistant deputy minister, Peter McGovern, who's now retired. Um, and he had five months to put the world's first cloud-based, secure social media collaboration site in place. And without his courage and his, I don't care. Every, he's known in the system as being a cowboy. I think that's a badge of honor. Um, but his lack of fear of here. failure when 20 world leaders are coming and you got five months and you got nothing done and we had to do it different in partnership with the private sector. Like, you know, that's not, that's not a thing you do. Um, like that showed me that, yeah, you find people in the system. And for me, like that fear of failure is what cripples a lot of our leadership in a digital age. And it's something that we haven't prepared a lot of, of public sector leadership mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, and and it's, nobody wants to be in the, like nobody wants to embarrass their minister. Okay, I get it. You know, uh, absolutely not. So so, but it is something that we have to learn to deal with better. We do. There's some speaking truth to power there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, I think that um, you know, I'd say one of the things that um, I think characterizes characterizes a lot of the digital leaders that 
um, that I've um, particularly appreciated working with is um, their focus on empowering their teams, right, and building, mm -hmm. um, you know, to your point about the shit umbrella, you know, effectively creating the conditions for the team um, to succeed. And really, I feel like, you know, that's maybe a broader point that we can apply, uh, you know, to other contexts as well when we think about leadership. But, but I suppose it's the, the essence of leadership, which I believe is about being a servant leader. It's about, um, you know, um, in, a, in a sense, stepping into the background and letting your team um, you know, really thrive and um, do the great work and, you know, um, enjoy the success that comes with doing that work. So, um, so I think, you know, that's, that's one thing to be thinking about. And I think, you know, that does mean that actually um, a lot of the work, I think, of a digital leader is about um, doing the, a lot of the hard graft behind the scenes. You know, you talked about those conversations that, that go on um, around, you know, how do you overcome these kind of different institutional barriers so that the team, you know, can get on and do the things which, as you say also, is um, not necessarily something that needs to cost a lot of money. Um, if you give a small team the opportunity, mm. you know, you truly do empower them, they can deliver an awful lot in a short period of time. Absolutely, and I, I agree with the shit umbrella for sure. But it, it has to be an umbrella, but not like a not 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 a not a veil, you know. Because I think one of the things that I have found, and I think maybe um, learned this from some of the leaders that I've worked for, and I try to do as well. I mean, I you know come back to my team and tell them everything that's going on, like about those hard conversations that I'm having at the political level, at the higher levels. Here's the challenges I'm facing. Like here's what we're here's what we're hearing. Here's how we're gonna here's how we're gonna overcome it. Here's how we're gonna work through it. Um, and then, you know, also creating, so creating that, that safe space for teams to work and to fail isn't creating a walled garden. I think it's also, you know, I think especially in digital leadership doing innovation work, yeah. you've got to see those lines of sight. You've got to know what you're dealing, I think, you know, mm -hmm. dealing, I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe you don't team, maybe you think it's terrible hearing all my, you know, some of the, you know, some of the stuff I come back to the, you know. Too much honesty. Back, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I, I think it helps. I, I think it's good to know what we're, what we're really, what we're really, you know, um, both the successes and the challenges. But. I mean, if I could just add one thing, I'd just say, you know, in general as well, I'd encourage you to be, you know, curious about yeah. what, in, what makes internet era, you know, organizations successful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's easy for us to have a, to look and, uh, on a very shallow level say, you know, yeah, we know Amazon's a great success. And then the next thing we know, there's conversation about, you know, building like an e-commerce platform for government, right? Um, well, that's not really the thing that we really need to be learning from Amazon. So, um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's kind of like understanding, you know, what are, the, what are the principles that are being applied by these different organizations? What can we import to our context? Um, and being curious about that. Absolutely. Well, thank you, guys. Um, I am hoping that we have some... Oh, we, we, we definitely do now. How does this work? Apparently, there's a... A cube that will be thrown at you. I hope you're up for that. <laughs> Straight, it will activate to work for you and hold it back. Good luck. <laughs> I have never seen this before. It's an innovation. Amazing. It works. Thanks, everyone. Um, hello, uh, my name is Hiro. Uh, you talked a lot about failure, and I really appreciate that. I'm wondering, uh, we have a lot of people here in the room who are in leadership positions in government. Uh, what does it feel like to fail and move on? Like, not the, I'm not the intellectual part where you can tell the story. I'm, not, I'm interested in how do you stand in that failure and move forward, and, and what are some of the strategies that you have for being resilient in failure that you would want the room to hear about? I think it gets easier with time. If you fail a lot, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get good so, at it. I want to start there. Um, uh, I was. Uh, I'll give you a, just a really quick story. Like we, uh, you know, I the best learning experience I ever have. I was 33. I was appointed CEO of a Crown Corp, running our national museums, and our flagship museum shut down a month into the job. It was supposed to be a super nice, easy gig. And like for nine months, I stood in, like I had to stand in front and learn to be honest really quickly because if you just bullshit your way through the reason why things happened, uh, people pick up on that lack of authenticity. And so at first I was being defensive, trying, thinking I was defending the organization and it turns out that by 
taking that position and not just, frankly, just taking it and being honest that, listen, we don't have money. We weren't given money. We haven't been given money in 25 years. The roof caved in. Like, what was it? Like, you know what I mean? And just actually, and knowing that that was going to cause me political problems because I've just basically thrown two governments under the bus in the process. Um, I think it, for me, that was a learning opportunity of like, it sucks. You learn to embrace it. I think what's important is when you go home, you have a support network that removes you from an environment where you have to take that heat, not just for the team because it's the right thing to do, but just because you have to. So the support network is important. Mm -hmm. I think your level, your, your comment, your last comment on transparency with the team on how you feel about stuff also very much helps. Or about the feelings. Right, if you're, if you're a robot, like, like, you, like I would go back in and, I, and everybody would be like, are you okay? And I would say like, actually, no. no. That's like, the <laughs> kids are gonna see that on the news and I know what I just said it was stupid. Right, like, like, no, this is shit. <laughs> like, this is not fun. Um, so I think being honest also helps a lot, um, but it's not fun. You, you know, if you're in a position of leadership, everybody's a leader, I get that, but if you're the person that has to stand in front of the camera, in front of the mic, you're gonna wear it, and you have to learn how to wear it, and you have to learn how to, I think honesty is the only way to get out of it in those cases, but you will be stressed out of your mind, and, and a lot of the, like, going, the Phoenix thing, like, you know, frankly, in Ottawa, there wasn't a day for three years that I don't go to the grocery and it's like, are you going to fix Phoenix yet? And it's like, it wasn't my mess, but okay, you know, but like, yes. what do you do? <laughs> um, so I, I just think you have to kind of learn to, to cope with it. And there's a whole bunch of different reasons that make it easier or not. So hopefully I gave you enough time to think about a better <laughs> answer. Than I, I wanted to. I think that's such a good question. Thank you so much yeah. for it. And I, and I totally support you. I have a hard you. time expressing feelings. So, you know, here we oh, go. Oh, <laughs> I don't at all. We're all about the feels where I work. There you but, go. but, you know, the other thing, too, I think that what, what we try to do is, is create smaller fails. You know, I mean, you sure. didn't have a choice. You got thrown into Phoenix. For sure. Right? Which is, which is the problem, right? I mean, if it had been smaller fails along the way, it wouldn't have been as hard. And that's something that we're really really doing with with the work that we're doing it's like this is the, this is it like do a small piece and see how that goes and yes we have had definitely had some had some fails but they have been smaller and more contained mm. and then it's like move on you know what did you learn and how do you move on like I think that really helps like the worst thing is is, is to allow yourself to kind of you know stew I think in that mm -hmm. but, to, but to, to to use that to I mean everyone says this learn from it and move on but it's actually true right so mm -hmm. but if you contain the blast radius you know up front you define what you're going to do and make it small Smaller, that makes it more that makes it more manageable a little bit anyway but you're right about all the other things too yeah I mean I think that it depends on your definition of failure right because I think that actually true failure is doing the same thing multiple times true um, and expecting a different result is that right? failure is that another thing yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe that's lunacy Both. But, uh, um, <laughs> but the um, but I think the reality is like you know if you look around in you know um, the public service, there's failure everywhere, right? And actually, there's failure. Uh, oh. <laughs> what? Private it's sector true. as well. Private yeah. sector as well, for Absolutely. sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. In large, in large pre internet organizations, yeah, public or private, there is and, it, and the failure is baked into the way that people, you know, mm. to the kind of processes that um, have become the way that the organization does things. It's tolerated. And, and yeah, it's just tolerated failure, exactly. It's not called out as failure. So, um, so I agree. That doesn't mean that it's easy, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we set up the digital services unit in the Ministry of Justice, um, when we were eight people, we, uh, we, with our mandate from the board, we, we uh, boldly wrote out to the 85,000 employees in the Ministry of Justice and we said, right, we're now going to operate a digital gateway. Everything has to come through us. And of course, <laughs> we almost promptly disappeared under the deluge in terms of the response. Um, that's kind of embarrassing. It's kind of an obvious um, you know, kind of mistake which you can avoid, actually. Um, but you just kind of have to um, say, well, OK, we need to course correct. We're not going to do that again. Um, and, and I think it's, as you say, it's making sure that you've got the support networks to um, you know, to encourage you on those difficult days because there'll be, there'll be a, you know, if today's a bad day, there's a, there's a good day around the corner. Can I, can I reverse your question just a little bit since, you know, I have a mic and it's great, so I can do <laughs> yeah. that a little bit. Um, I, I do think the positive side of when you get out of a situation like that is, is like, I'll just speak for the, the teams I saw in the civil service. Um, when you actually tell people it's okay like if you're honest with them and you're having an honest conversation and you see people's stress levels go down, if you're able to create an environment where it's like, okay, like you screwed up, mm -hmm. 
right? Uh, mm -hmm. To your point, like, don't do it again. Or mm -hmm. I, I think there's, there's, I've seen it many, many times after, not the day of the massive failure, probably everybody's freaking out, but at minimum, at least the next day after, where if you're able to have an honest team conversation about it, right, um, mm -hmm. that you, it actually builds something positive moving forward. I'm not trying to be cheesy in what I'm saying, but it actually, like, you know, it makes you stronger as a team if you're able to have that open dialogue. And, and actually, you see people's, like, shoulders just go, oh, okay, yeah. So, so, so now what, right, so. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, we've got lots. <laughs> I'll let the people with the cubes manage it. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, so Alex, you had mentioned um, the need for DMs to, you know, get their hands dirty with the work of delivery, which I agree with. And I'm just wondering how much success you had in <laughs> that endeavor. Uh, just because as, on the practitioner side, we're, we're often the ones that are in the situation of having to deliver the solution within three months or whatever, because it's linked to you know a DM or an ADM's performance review, right? No. What you yes. <laughs> no. You know it's true. No. Uh, listen, I think the ones that I've seen that do the better job are the ones that like we we have these things like skip level meetings and uh, you know you, you got to meet the person that's below your direct report like and you do that once a year and like I guess that makes it better. Um, you know, uh, the ones that I could tell you that I've seen that have had an impact in their organization and how they're trying to change is they would go in their org charts and say, okay, well, if it's this project, I want to talk to the person that's doing it. Not four layers up, because we all know that adding a comma to a briefing note adds a lot of value, right? But like the person that's actually doing the project and that like, I, so I ran it that way personally, but I have to tell you the flip side of that is it puts a lot of pressure on the management and you have to have trust. My last job, I didn't have it as much as I had with the museum gig because we were faced with a crisis that it was like out of this world, so it created trust or not, <laughs> right? But the other stuff was a bit harder because it was bigger, um, but just be aware that the ones that do that, the flip side is the result is probably a little bit better, but you're creating, an, like it's like you're squeezing something here and then you're creating another problem elsewhere. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, but the deputies that did it the best went in the organization and, and actually, you know, pick the people that were doing the work and brought them to the meetings. And not just once for show, that's the other thing. Like it's a regular thing, right? Because um, if you do it once for show, if you do skip level once a year, that's, that's fake. People know that's fake. Like let's just call a spade a spade, right? So. Um, so you talked about talking to the customers and getting into that journey and being really in that. And you've also talked about what needs to be happened on change on a system level. But what is the challenge have any of you faced when going to change a service and digitizing that service and the employees who may have been helping deliver that service mm -hmm. sometimes for 20, 30 years mm -hmm. and the changing of how they do their job can be extremely difficult and the managing of that change. Sounds like a personal question. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's such a good question. And I think, gosh, where's Jess? I mean, we were, we were having this conversation today with, you know, with, with one of the programs that we're working with. And I think the ADMs in that group were, you know, were, were really aware that that was going to be the case for a lot of their staff. Like, these are really frontline service delivery people. And like, I don't want to say that we have all the answers in the way we do this, this service design approach, but I do think it really helps. So, and this working in the open really helps. So when we, when we put together teams, we make sure we, we actually have on the team representation from frontline staff. And again, this like demoing what you're building all the way along, it really starts helping. It's a, it's, it's a really, I think, effective change management kind of approach. So I, 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 having, you know, having a new process or a new technology done to you is, is, a, is a terrible feeling. And we really try to avoid that. I mean, I think, you know, our, our folks, James can speak to that with, you know, with, with, with the child care digital service. A lot of people who've delivered that service in a different way. Um, but you, you know, you've really brought folks along at every sort of step of the journey. And again, like releasing software early, I mean, this sounds so mechanical and technical, but it, really it makes a difference. Instead of like waiting for years to release a big thing, if you start incrementally releasing things, people start getting used to it, seeing how it works, actually having real opportunities to feedback on what doesn't work, you, you start getting that. But I mean, I won't, you know, I, I, 
I won't say that there aren't people whose jobs, you know, maybe are threatened by that. And again, this was where the honesty comes in as well, too. Because when we do projects, we end up with really like having organizational design conversations that you need you need to have. So for me, it's 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 all of those pieces that work together in in making that change a little bit more manageable. But there's not sort of one thing. There's not one easy answer to that one for sure. And acknowledging that that's a real thing is is a big part of it too. Mm -hmm. How's, you've, you've had similar. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as, as Dom says, it's not always a straightforward um, question to answer. But um, certainly, I would say, on balance, um, there was ultimately, I think, more enthusiasm from those who had been stuck in having to deliver services in a fairly rigid way for a long period um, than there was kind of negative feedback. So. Um, you know, if I give one example of prison officers in the UK prison system who um, were having to do what I would describe as relatively low value work relative to you know, their entire set of duties by managing a really convoluted visit, visitor booking system, um, which essentially meant manning the phones, right? And, which would take them away from other duties which they needed to perform and put pressure on them in the day-to-day. -day. They were largely positive about the idea of, you know, as much as possible automating that process and making it very much more efficient. So I would also say that some of the best, um, you know, kind of what we call product managers or service managers, those who are now responsible for managing the end-to-end -end services that are being redesigned, came from... Um, frontline areas, right? So they're people who didn't have any digital experience, hadn't worked in this way before, but were super enthusiastic, had a lot to bring, a lot of knowledge to bring to the to the party, and um, were very, you know, kind of well placed to step into some of the new roles that we were, you know, starting to um, put in place. So there is opportunity. There is often positive feedback. To your point, there's not always an easy answer where jobs will be threatened. Um, but also, I don't think that in the end, um, that can be an argument for continuing to operate you know, a substandard service. Um, I think uh, I might have more of a Machiavellian style of leadership or management. You might. Yes, <laughs> um, like, so listen, definitely start with inclusiveness. Start with the co-design thing. Um, Absolutely, and, and often it works, so in fairness, it could take you longer. There are periods of times, though, where, you know, after a while, that doesn't work. So, you know, there's a carrot and there's a stick. And if you are in a leadership or a management position, sometimes, I'm not saying it's a stick, we, you know, I'm not saying you hit people, none of that. I know it's being filmed, all that <laughs> disclaimer stuff, <laughs> right? But, um, you know, some of the things I've done in the past, and I apologize if there's anybody that I've managed in the past that's now going to listen to this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, you give more budget to the group that you want, yep. that has the behavior that you want to see exemplified, mm -hmm. and you put them on a pedestal. Um, and so a couple things will happen to that. I got in trouble in my last job because I was at an all-staff, and we had just started, and I said, listen, like, the next three years are going to be bumpy, like, buckle up, and this may not be for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and people would voluntarily leave, right? And, and I'm, I'm not against that. Doesn't mean you don't do the inclusivity thing. Doesn't mean you don't do all of those things and bringing people together. But sometimes, if you're going to change the thing, you got to, you know, you're going to make omelets. You kind of got to break some eggs. Um, so I think the question becomes: of How do they then do that without like, com like, like and still treating people humanely, right? Like it's not. So you know, the follow-up to that statement of this may not be for you is: If you want to go somewhere else, you come to me directly, and I will find you a place where you're more comfortable. But we're about to redo our access to information laws. It's going to be tough. It's going to suck, okay? It's a very broad stakeholder community. It's going to be bumpy. Uh, and we found people work elsewhere. So, I mean, it's, a, it's not like a, it's something you'd hear in a management book. You'd hear about, you know, bring people along and a good leader does that. And sometimes that's, that's really true, but a lot of the times, like, that's just not a possibility. Yeah, so you got to be able to kind of pivot. And, and, and sometimes the old co, new co model within an organization is the only way to do it. And you will get the people that then, you know, gravitate towards, well, if, you know, that's the thing, then they'll follow along and they'll, you know, begrudgingly follow along. But then you just have to deal with that with your corporate culture as well.
at Cube Scares the Bejesus. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Leah. I actually work in banking, so they apparently let, let me <laughs> sneak in here. <laughs> but seeing as how I work in banking, you should have expected that, I guess. Um, so there were a couple of things that came up that were particularly interesting to me. So I, I also, I'm a product manager by trade. Um, and two of them were uh, the questions about like how you handle budget cuts, um, but also the questions around AI, right? And some of the feedback was like, you know, you have to get the plumbing in place first. Um, and I know like for us, I know how we would do it, but I also understand our priorities because I know who my customer is like really, really clearly. So I understand how to deliver value to them and how to prioritize. So I'm wondering, how do you prioritize? Like, is there a matrix that you break things down? Because you have really disparate stakeholders who change. So when you're planning these huge multi-million dollar projects, how do you actually decide what goes ahead? What's the smart choice? You want to start or? No, I don't. <laughs> right. So the fact that you but got all three really of us looking question. at yeah, the going, ball is, uh, it means it's a great question. It does um, mean it's a great so, question. So listen, I, I, I'm going to be negative at first in this too. answer, and then I'm, I'm going to turn, try to turn it around by filibusting. Um, so <laughs> we've been in government. <laughs> um, I think because of, so first of all, what I tried to change when I was there is I never wanted to see a five, 10-year project like, so the, everything over a certain threshold would come to Treasury Board for oversight. And I was happy if nothing came to Treasury Board for oversight, because that means people would have pushed it down to a lower value, a lower time frame, a lower everything that they could then adjust and sort of pivot. Um, so, so that was the first thing we tried to do. And the reason I wanted that to happen is because when it's a five to 10 year thing, of course you don't have empathy. Because most people aren't in that job by the time the service is delivered. Whereas in, I suppose in your world, I've never worked in the banking world, but you start losing customers pretty quickly. And, and frankly, there's a bottom line assigned to that. And then you see it and you pivot. Well, you don't get that a lot, at least at the federal level. I know municipal will be different and I know prevent because there's more citizen interaction. But like at the federal level, we've lost empathy like a long time ago because everything turned into five or 10 year projects. We lost empathy because we kept adding service, you know, sort of uh, service channels to citizens. Like I joked this morning with our Edmonton, city of Edmonton folks, like the only reason we don't have telegraph as a service is because there's no <laughs> more posts and the service is dead, but we still have fax, we still have mail, we still have in person. We now have this internet thing, right? And that we're trying to figure out and we would never make the tough challenge, the tough call of saying, why can't we just kill the freaking fax machine? Like, can we just take that out as a service option, right? Yeah, and so I think we've lost a lot of the empathy. So that's the negative part. I think there's some progress being made. I think the GDS stuff in the UK really started setting the tone for public sector recon reconnecting with, with citizens. Um, not an excuse for the feds in Canada, but you guys have health, for example, in the, at a federal level that we don't. So, um, but so for us, it's been a hard pivot federally because, I mean, what do we do for a service? Taxes, right? Uh, probably employment insurance is our biggest, you know, OAS. And, but even that stuff is like, you know, like we've lost empathy, right? And we've made excuses for not getting in touch with the citizen as much as we should have. So the answer is probably we don't have the same sort of driving factor to, to push us, at least again, federally, mm -hmm. to that direct citizen engagement as much as we should. I think it's a super question. I think I, I think I, I'm just going to say I think it's something government really does wrong. That we really need to rethink that. And I think you know what, what Roger was saying about really kind of understanding where the actual demands are for citizens, and that's what we're trying to do, right? It's like what is the real problem we're trying to solve? And it's about honesty too. It's like again, it's looking at what is the total cost of ownership of the service you're delivering. Be honest about that, and then and then measure what actually matters, right? So it's 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 something structurally that that I, I really want to take on more with our office. I think we need to do that and offices like mine, which yours was kind of like too, have kind of pushed that ball up the hill and looked at that kind of thing. And I think there's better, better models in the private sector. So yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, I think we really have a problem. And maybe part of, you know, what we're dealing with now in terms of crisis, I mean, you know, budget is actually going to make us ask some really hard questions. Because yeah, what happens is, you know, you spend years and years writing a really complex business case. And what gets funded is what sounds good in that business case. And you haven't really, you have not validated that with people. You have not 
prototyped it to see if it actually makes a difference. You've just told a really frickin' good story, and that is not what we should fund. So we need to be really, really honest about that now. So yeah, wake up. We're gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know I agree. I think c certainly when you, when you're talking about large multi-million-dollar projects, we wanted to move away from that. We wanted to break things down into much smaller pieces. You know, we wanted to, you know. Um, put an end to, you know, the big IT contracts. We wanted to say, you know, actually it's all about, you know, starting small, delivering an ecosystem of, of services, you know, and um, starting to see smaller pieces of technology that were um, loosely coupled and, you know, creating a, an architecture that was more flexible for us to kind of, you know, put new pieces in, take um, old pieces out and so on. Um, now, is it, is it easy in this kind of context to do that? No. You know, even the UK, which started on this journey like, you know, 2011, um, is it all sorted? Far from it. Um, but um, I think that's part of it. And I think in terms of, like, the prioritization, then it becomes, you know, a, a, to some extent, a kind of strategic choice about, what, you know, what, what comes first. And so for us in justice, it might have been, at a particular time, a desire to take um, as much, um, if you like, business as we called it, out of the courts um, that could be automated or that could be delivered online or that could be, you know, provided through um, digital channels in some way. Um, so that would be um, a, a sort of more of a strategic priority which would have been set um, by the board and then we would have kind of acted accordingly with our kind of service choices. Can I have one more little answer to that? Sorry, sure. if I'm not cutting you off. I mean, with our little office, we do have funding to support projects, and we certainly have way more demand than than we than than we have money or, or effort to. Use. So we're we're looking at what is the criteria for that, right? And I mean, we have different criteria. You need executive support that will be bold. You need a you know a a, a risk positive team. You need, but what you really really need is a good problem. Like, don't come with your idea of what a solution might be. Come with a really, really good problem that you've documented. So it's kind of flipping, like traditional government business cases. Here's a good solution. Maybe we have a problem. We're like, show us a really, really good problem, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll work on that together. So, which is also about honesty, too. Like, let's admit, something's broken here. Mm. <laughs> Our budgeting process. So. Yeah, that too. Please. Uh, hello, my question is, is about uh, celebrating successes. I'm going to assume that you have had successes in your jobs on, because uh -huh. we've talked a lot about <laughs> yeah. failure. Why don't we turn it around and uh, um, ask, uh, how do you celebrate successes in, uh, in your roles as leaders? Does food count? Um, sure. we, we do a lot of a lot of snacking around the big table. I think that's the, you know it, that's that's I mean we, we, we really do, and I think we you know even just the kind of work environment that we've created um, in, just in terms of an open space and sharing those kind of things together and and always you know always doing that. Um, we definitely do. I mean I think it's something that we I, I've been thinking about more that we should probably do more you know a, a little bit more publicly. But yeah, I mean it's 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 um, it really you know team team celebrations having a lot of formal, you know, and formal ways, but what about you guys? What do you, what do, you do around it? It's a great question. Yeah, I mean, cake was always a big thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just seems like yeah. food is a huge I mean, part if, of it. Yeah. If, <laughs> if you look at, if you look at sort of any kind of, um, of, the, of the blogs online around the, the, the government digital service in the UK, you know, you'll see plenty of, you'll see plenty <laughs> of, uh, of, of photos of people I'm consuming all us. kinds of weird and wonderful cakes to celebrate. Um, you know, the kind of launch of a new service or the release mm -hmm. of, a, of a particular part of a new service and so on. The other thing was um, that Chris, who's, who's here tonight, who's the head of design at the uh, Canadian Digital Service, was talking about earlier today, which we also did in the UK, was these things um, that were drawn, were based on the idea of the, the NASA mission patches. So essentially like stickers, um, which were given out to uh, different members of the team um, to, you know, really kind of acknowledge their contribution um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we did all kinds of crazy things. We, we, we kind of designed sort of fake road signs um, and had everybody sign them. Um, they went up on the wall. All these kinds of things to kind of really acknowledge 
the contribution of different team members. I think it's, you know, I think some of the things that we, that when we started our office that we just, we just wanted to have an opportunity to work differently. And it's like, you know, there was a lot of things, but one of them was just like, we're just, we're going to just use Slack. We're just going to use different ways of communicating. And I think that we, I mean, we have entire, you know, hashtag food. But I mean, I think just the fact that we communicate so much as a team, there's always this little like, you know, unicorn emoji when someone's done something good. And we're very open about those everyday struggles, you know, and I think, I think we're really supportive and it certainly helps me you know I feel really cheered on by the team and and I, I hope that I share that back it's it, it which is different than traditional government ways of working you know or maybe you'll have a staff meeting once every two weeks and that's when you'll talk about you know what's been good and what hasn't been but we we have such an ambient way of working that I think that helps but I think it's important to acknowledge the big things like James has you know launched the child care digital service like that's a big banner thing and we're going to make a big deal about that you know I mean and and you know we also make sure that you know our ministers are on board with what we're doing and that they are speaking that as well and that that there's that level of leadership so it's 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 right from the working team up to the minister is aware of what we're doing and we make sure that everybody is you know is I mean I'd say you know I'm here with my pom-poms I say it all the time because we really do celebrate the great work never okay. enough that everyone who does our work deserves more this is a case where going last really sucked because I'm not sure what else I could add other than what I said. But, um, yeah, I, a couple of things I guess that I would only add to it. Like we were very fortunate for uh, a three-year period at uh, in the government Canada where we had Minister Bryson, uh, who this was his favorite file. You know, by far changing government, digital government. He'd been in politics for a long time. I won't say how long, but a long time, and you know, he was eager to change it. So. It meant he, he would also look at, like he would, it would make the civil service uncomfortable, but he would come down from, you know, the top floor and, and like, you know, tell you what, what are some of the things that have happened, like, you know, that I could go talk to people and congratulate them and thank them for their work. Um, and, and you take it for granted when you deal with a minister every day, right? But if you're, if, if you're not and you're not used to seeing him or you see Minister Bryson, who was a very charming man, like come up to you and thank you you know, like that, that was very powerful. I, like I, I paid very close attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond the food, obviously, uh, we, we had a lot of alcohol too, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> we do uh, too. So, so beyond that, <laughs> um, but that, 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 that was something that resonated with me. The other thing that I, that I, I was always trying to do is, is speaking of working in the open is like, never use your social media for a personal platform and, and use it for a platform for other people and highlighting other works. Um, became something that I tried to do. I, I, it took me a while to learn that, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, and that became other departments in my role because it was pan-government. So actually talking about wins from other departments or other things like mm -hmm. that as well. So that became an important thing as well. I remember getting an email from another deputy minister saying, hey, you gave a shout out to our department and everybody was glowing. And I was like, wow, okay, well, it was 180 characters. So let's, let's, let's do that again, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. so, and then sort of that became, that became interesting. So, so anyway, so other things other than cake and, and, and <laughs> celebrating, because we obviously did that. Cake and slack, of course you did. Oh. I, have to, I have to hold it? Okay. Um, so my name is Jing Jing. I'm actually uh, from uh, a marketing and design agency here in Edmonton. Um, I think what we've heard from all three of you is um, it's, this is the time that we're breaking away from signing large contracts large IT contracts with big IT vendors. So this sounds like there's an opportunity for a lot of smaller players to, to come into this, this world and um, to play a role that um, you wouldn't normally, like in the past you wouldn't be able to compare, to compete with some of the larger IT companies. So I'm just wondering if, if you can share your, some of your experiences working with a smaller firm and um, what, what are you looking for in a smaller firm and what, what kind of advice that you, you would give to a smaller firm, a smaller vendor? Yeah. Thank you. No, a great question. I think, listen, I think there's a direct correlate. If we have bought the same way for the last 50 years, 100 years, we will get the same result. Um, and so if you are the liar, largest buyer of technology in the country um, and you spend three years designing requirements which only large firms can contribute to the dialogue, you actually create an industry, like my wife's a proposal manager for a large tech firm, right? And so I would hear it every day, 
right, going back home on how our bidding process doesn't work, <laughs> right, because like she was ripping her hair out. Um, the second we started pivoting to a, a problem-based approach as opposed to a solution definition-based approach, um, first of all, we got way less big bids. Like, you know, it was like 100, 200, 300K bids, but like a lot of them. Um, and all of a sudden, we started seeing much better participation from smaller firms. And only once we started releasing the data, putting a problem out on the street. So their first, call it agile procurement, was 80K, it wasn't much. But it's to prove to the system that we didn't have to change any of the laws, because that was the excuse I was getting. Mm -hmm. Well, the laws don't permit it. Okay, like the best thing you ask for in government is like, show me where in writing it says that I can't do what I want to do. Right? Or your policies. It's like, okay, well, I own all the policies, and I can tell you that I don't know where in the policies it says I can't do this. So we needed to prove that we could buy different. Mm -hmm. So we just put the problem out on the street, the data, two pagers, please don't break our privacy act or whatever, you know, the basic tombstone laws. We got 11 responses back. We used uh, the four finalists as a bake-off. It took about a month. It didn't take four years, right, because you don't have capacity to, for a four-year response. Um, that also favors big companies. And we ended up using all four finalists at the end. Right? Everybody um, won. So, there, so in typical Canadian fashion, there's no winner. Everybody wins. Yeah, rah, rah, rah. Right? But like, like you know, well, that's, participation that's medal. Right? And all but of you're that. getting more opportunity spread around, you know. And absolutely, and seven billion dollars should not be yeah. going into the hands of the same three companies, yeah. mm -hmm. um, because that doesn't that doesn't get you any further. So, so but now what we're starting to see is participation between big firms and smaller firms, because yep. there's things that you guys offer that. Like, because we've created a model of response, we then get the same kind of response. Yeah. And so we have to break that. It's a cycle. It's all it is. It is. Well, it's, it's a big cycle. But yeah. yeah and, and I think then to be just really, I can't get him because be collaborative. It solves everything. But it kind of does. And I think, like, we, we, we're working with smaller companies now who have not worked, you know, on the kind of projects we're doing in government. And I think we, you know, we, we, we have a lot to learn from each other, you know. We just, we just want to try to be, truly be collaborative. And not to, like, we don't want to manage things to the letter of a deliverable and a contract. We don't want to get ourselves in a situation where, where we're, we're fighting over change requests and managing at the micro level. It just doesn't give anyone a chance to be creative. So we try to keep things open enough that, like, we have enough space here that we can work together on this. Let's agree on the big thing we're trying to do, you know, looking at people who we work with, you know, and, and we're, we're going to get there and we, we got to have some patience with each other. And I think it's working, you know, it's, it's, it's a learning process and it's worth doing. And we have amazing talent in this, in this province, amazingly good, you know, good people who can, who we really want to bring in on those projects. So we're trying, we're trying to do some of that structural change that you did. We've done a little bit of it. We have a long way to go. You did a ton of it. So we have good models, but it's not there yet, right? Like we know that the RFPs and the you know, procurement you're going to see from the government right now probably does not favor smaller companies. But we're, 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 we're going to get there. We have to. We get better value. It's better value for taxpayers, right, yeah. if we do that. I mean, I'd just add one thing, and it's to um, maybe be a little provocative, but so um, what I found is that um, Can't be him. There's, 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 there's sometimes... Um, a change of mindset and a change in terms of ways of working that's required of the vendor, of the supplier as well. Um, so, for instance, when um, we were bringing suppliers, smaller suppliers, into work with us in the UK, um, we were pretty much requiring that they co-locate with our teams, right? So we wanted to have a mixed model. We wanted to bring suppliers in. We wanted to ensure that there was that kind of turnover in terms of ideas and skills and all the rest of it. But... Um, we were fairly demanding in terms of, um, you know, actually how we wanted that team to operate. So, um, and I know, you know, myself having worked agency side, it doesn't always fit comfortably no. um, with existing agency models. So um, it's something to be thinking about, I think, if you're looking to do more work with government. And in defense of big companies as well, yeah. they don't like bidding on work from the government of Canada either. Like no. We leave them hanging for three or four years. It costs millions of dollars to respond to, and there's one winner, which is what a winner is, by the way. But like, anyway, so, so I get that. But like, so like, it's costly. It, it takes a lot of time. It sucks up a lot of resources. Like, it's not good for anybody. No. Oh, I, can't, I don't even know where you would start. So yes, I, I think you are starting from further back. But my point being is like, the whole model is just not on procurement, on public procurement of tech. Yep. versus buying digital stuff and co-designing and co-locate. Like, it's just, we haven't made the pivot in procurement at all. Like, 
generally speaking. I think BC is probably the place that's done the most work in this yeah. space in Canada. Yeah, we worked on that hard. It's, and it's still not perfect there either, but I think Sabina had a question. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dominique. So I'm Sabina Fossenjewski. I'm the sector CIO for the social sector collaborating with Dominique and uh, former Fed, Shared Services yeah. Canada, impacted by Phoenix. It's been two years. Um, <laughs> but it's okay. I, I'm very fortunate where I am. Um, I have a number of questions, but the, the one more general one, perhaps for, for the broader audience, is in the evolution of the leadership role in technology and information management, all of these blends of things, we now come to the conversation about the chief digital officer and the chief innovation officer. And from the opening remarks, you know, that spoke to the AI pieces, more along that innovation, but the core theme here is digital, digital internet era. I'm curious whether the panel distinguishes a difference between a chief innovation officer versus a chief digital officer, respecting that those are titles, labels, mm -hmm. but um, in my view, in my mind right now, they are actually quite potentially distinctive roles, and I would appreciate your views. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Oh, you're looking at me with a funny face, so I'm going to buy you some time here. All right, sounds good. Uh, listen, I think it's all I think it's all bull. Sorry, I think it's just I think it's about getting the thing done. Yeah. Um, I think in typical government fashion, we like to distribute authorities because that's the Westminster model, and distributing authorities means people don't do crazy things. Um, I'm increasingly a fan of centralizing those authorities somewhere, so if you want to call it a chief innovation officer, a chief digital officer, a CIO, a CTO, I think it's about the way you work, right? And so if, it's, if your CIO doesn't work from the outside in for you, then fire your CIO, you know? Um, but I've seen CDOs that work the same way a CIO does, they've just changed the, the title on it. So for me, it's more about, from a leadership perspective, the things that you do, how quickly you deliver, are you delivering it differently? How many people can you bring along for the ride? Like those, those to me are a bit more important and I know I'm kind of turning your question around. But it reflects what you're suggesting, it's just a label. It is yeah. just a label. I think we, you know, I think the banks have done a, like a CISO at a bank is compliance and site, like, and, like it's very clear, right? Like I don't, I think for us in government it gets wishy-washy because we distribute things all over the place or different departments mm -hmm. do different things and then it gets more complicated and new government comes in, changes departmental names and things, like it just, it, it, it really, for me, it's always been find the leader that does stuff and then go work for them, like regardless of title, you know, mm -hmm. so. I mean, I kind of feel like with, like, as a uh, chief digital innovation officer, I guess. Sorry, I'm not, yeah, yeah no, sorry. No, no, no. no, but I feel like my, I should work myself out of a job. Like, this should yeah. not be a forever thing, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing that should be distributed in other levels of leadership. Or, you know, this is a kind of a temporary thing. Let's kind of get us into the next era. Let's get us doing digital. And then people like me should just go away and just get a real job, right? Like, you know, just be a real deputy, <laughs> right? And, and, and oh, run a real program of things, right? Like, I think, so I think in some ways it's a little bit, you know, a little bit transitional right now, you know? Yeah. But I think the good work can happen in any of those C-suite jobs, right? It's, it's what you make it. Yeah. I mean, what I think, think? Uh, agreed. I think the rise That's of the chief question. digital officer in many ways yeah. is just simply a reflection on the fact that the C-suite weren't doing what was necessary in moving organizations where they needed to go. And so there's this, you know, kind of recognition that there was this drive need that there was needed at that level to lead the charge in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, dare I say it, transformation. Um, Ugh, but, um, even worse. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, it's also important to bear in mind that sometimes um, you've got to think about in the early stages, at least, um, where is this new thing that we're building going to best thrive and how do we, how do we kind of create the conditions for that to happen? So, you know, there's a quote by like a systems theorist, um, Bucky Fuller, that, it, that goes something like, <laughs> you don't change the existing reality by fighting with it. Um, you change it by building a new reality and mm -hmm. making the old obsolete. Um, and I think to some extent, that's what um, needs to happen in a government situation because actually otherwise you can spend all your time fighting the old reality. So you've got to create mm -hmm. some kind of conditions for the new um, ways of working to flourish and before you can then flood the organization with those. Um, 
you know, again, whatever you call the kind of leader of that. Um, uh, it could be one thing, it could be another thing. Um, and I totally agree. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at uh, our journey in the UK, when we started out, the CDO wasn't really a thing. It didn't really, you know, back in sort of 2010, 11, it wasn't really a job that particularly existed anywhere. Um, and so it was more a recognition of what people were doing by giving them that title at that point. And then, um, and it was also a recognition that in places like the Ministry of Justice, where we had 800 in the legacy IT organization working in ways that we wanted to change, that actually we needed to um, sort of give this new thing opportunity to flourish before we could maybe bring those two mm -hmm. back together. So actually what you've got now is you've now got a Chief Digital and Information Officer yeah. in Tom Reed yeah. with a kind of digital and technology organization. And I think we can get there, right? I mean, it's hard for CIOs, I think, because you have so much to keep the lights on with, right? And that you also are told, you know, darn, you got to innovate all that stuff too, right? So, I mean, it's, it's, there's kind of two hats at once, right? I would just say, like, if you have, so I apologize as well. <laughs> but, um, okay, I'll shut up after. But if you have the word innovation or transformation in your title, you should really fight hard to get those words out of your title. Uh, just in general. So, so just because, it's you know, true. yeah, I, I think you should fight hard to get those, those words out of your title. Wow, what great questions. My goodness, thank you. Oh, we could stay all night, but no. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So I was going to ask you for that round of applause, but thank you all so much, Alex, Dominic, Roger. That was incredibly inspiring and thought-provoking, and indeed we could go on for some time and perhaps will yet, but this here, here ends the formal part of the lesson, <laughs> and uh, hopefully much more to continue. Good night, everyone. Thank you thank for coming. You.